Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Thank you for coming out on such a cold night. I, I was sitting at my house thinking, well, I'll get there and there'll be two people clutching their coffee. So um, I appreciate that you've come out. Somehow it feels kind of right that we're sitting here on such a cold night and what we're going to do is talk about love. The most important thing that this sweet lady said was, I do dance a mean tango. So, um, and that's kind of interesting because I think about relationships in terms of a dance. And um, I think that's interesting because lots of times when we've looked at relationships in the past, we've looked at them in terms of how individuals feel and how they manage their emotions, which is important. But I think what's changed about that is we've really started to understand this dance called a love relationship. And we've started to understand the impact that the emotional music in that dance has on each of the dancers. And I'm going to suggest to you tonight that that basically constitutes a revolution. Because um, in general, when I go around the world, it depends on, on where I'm talking. Um, it feels a little risky, actually, to stand up and talk about research. You know, we just did a, a wonderful brain scan study with um, some folks at the a neuroscientist at the University of Virginia. So sometimes I stand up and I talk about research. And then it feels quite risky to stand up and say, I'm a professor, I'm a researcher, I'm also a clinician, and I'm going to talk to you about something as nebulous and weird and strange as romantic love. Because some people say, well, you can't do that. What does science have to do with romantic love? Romantic love is Harlequin romances, Hallmark cards, roses on Valentine's Day, right? It really, it, you can't mix it with science. Science is about observation, detailed observation, detailed explanations, theories, prediction. So some people would say, you just can't mix the two. What I'm saying to you is the revolution is that we are mixing the two. There's really no reason why our most precious relationships shouldn't be studied and understood. After all, most of us structure our lives around those precious relationships. And it seems to me that as society gets a lonelier and lonelier place, we need those precious relationships more and more. So scientists must do this, but it's still quite um, a leap for some people. I remember as a young graduate student going to the University of British Columbia and going to talk to the head of a department. And um, he said to me, what are you interested in? I said, oh, well, I'm interested in emotion and how people change and psychotherapy and relationships and love. He said, we don't do any of that. <laughs> So I thought, I said, well, what do you do? He said, we test pers for personality disorders. Um, he gave me this long list, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm not going to make it here, right? So, so um, it is quite a leap. And one of the things that hit me about that was that I went to our own NAC um, a couple of months ago, and I sat there listening to Bizet's Carmen. And in the first act, she comes out and you know, seduces 30 soldiers with one pout, right? And she sings, very famous line, she sings, love is a gypsy child, a gypsy child that knows no law. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is that Bizet is now officially out of date. <laughs> and there are laws to love, of course there are, there are patterns in all human behavior there are laws to love, and what we understand, we can shape. So that's a huge shift, it seems to me, from thinking about love as this sort of frenzy of sex and sentiment, which is still out in the popular literature, as this mystery that nobody can understand, and as something that you fall into or fall out of. Really? <laughs> is that the best we can do? for our most precious relationships, you fall in and you fall out? No, I don't think so. I think we can do better than that. The other thing about it is, I think it is more important than ever for us to do better than that. Because we depend on our intimate relationships 
in a whole new way in this society. We don't live in small villages anymore, most of us, surrounded by people we grew up with who have this incredible web of social support that we live our lives in that web. Most of us do not live that way. Most of us live our lives connecting with very few people, and for many of us, the most important person of all is our partner. If you look in Love Sense, I talk about in the last chapter how it is really quite a social experiment to think about the fact that so many people live alone, Although you can have this sense of intimate connection and love, even if you live alone, it's an emotional reality. I always use the example of the Dalai Lama. If you listen to the Dalai Lama, he always talks about his mother's love. I don't know if you heard him when he came to Ottawa. And he doesn't say, I think of my mother and you know, put roses on her grave and get sentimental about her. He says, when I think of my, love, my mother, I feel her love. And when I feel her love, I feel stronger and calmer. And I always feel like leaping up and saying, excuse me, you're talking about an attachment bond, you know? You know you're talking about attachment. That would be kind of inappropriate, so I sit and do what you do in front of the Dalai Lama, which is keep quiet and you know, admire everything he says. But as we get lonelier and lonelier in our society and have less and less of a sense of community, our intimate relationships become somehow our only source of support. Therefore, we really need to have a theory of love. We need to have a science of love. We need to understand what is going on here. After all, those relationships are now the basis of our families. We stay together and create families on the basis of this thing called affection and emotional connection. So I think we have to understand it. We cannot base our families on a shadow and on a fairy tale. That just doesn't work. So I'm going to talk about love and science. And I'm going to talk about, one of the reasons I'm going to talk about love and science is because I just have to. And what I mean by that is that after 30 years of working with couples, and helping couples heal their relationships, and really, at this point, really feeling pretty confident that we know how to do that, and 16 outcome studies, and 15 years working with my wonderful colleagues who are studying adult bonding, I become very distressed when I go down, to example, for my local bookstore, Chapters in the Market, right, with my coffee cup in my hand, Right, which you're not supposed to do, actually. I don't think you're supposed to walk. Never mind. So um, I go down there with my coffee cup in my hand, and I look around at all the books, and I look in the New York Times and all the articles, and what I see is it feels to me like, as a, as a species, we are all driving blindly over a huge dark cliff of pessimism about relationships. I see article after article about Marriage is finished, monogamy is impossible, nobody can make things last, affairs are good for your relationship, we're totally self-sufficient, if you're upset, meditate, it'll be fine, because after all, we all know that we're all supposed to be completely self-sufficient, and I see all this stuff. So it feels like we're all going over the edge of this cliff of pessimism, when from my point of view, just over the hill, there's a long, straight freeway called We've Cracked the Code of Love Freeway, and it takes us home. It takes us home to a place called we have this wired-in longing for emotional connection and to create a bond that is going to last a lifetime. There was recently a wonderful survey of 18-year-olds. Think of the 18-year-olds. Think of the sort of stuff that they're exposed to in this society. So I was really fascinated to find out that what these 18-year-olds said was when you asked them what they longed for and what was important in their life, they said, we want someone to love, we want a good relationship in our lives, and if possible, we want that to last a lifetime. Very interesting that that longing is still there. So it seems to me that I have to talk about love because I have this sense of this great freeway that we suddenly know how to do it. The other reason why I'm going to talk to you about love is simply that I can. 
that there now exists, in the, over the last 15 years, there now exists a really clear sense of what matters in love relationships, what they're all about, how they go wrong, how we put them right, and why they are so incredibly important to us. And one of the things we've started to understand is that emotional isolation, not having this emotional connection to at least one other person who will come when you call, let me put it another way. Standing in the universe and saying, who is there for me? Are you there for me? Do I matter to someone? Will you come when I call? And hearing no answer or a no is deeply traumatizing to human beings because we are bonding animals. We are emotional animals, we are social animals, and we are bonding animals. We have the longest period of time of any animal when we are small, when our brain is being formed, it is literally true that if we call and no one comes, we die. So what we've known for a long time in psychology is that isolation is inherently traumatizing for human beings. Now we're really starting to take that and make sense of it and understand the flip side, which is the power of a loving relationship and how very good that is for human beings. How a loving relationship, for example, um, makes your immune system work better, lowers your heart rate, um, uh, makes, depressive, makes you much less likely to get depressed, much less likely to suffer from anxiety disorders. It makes you much more resilient from, for stress because after all, what you do when a dragon comes for you is you, the first thing you do is you reach out for a hand to help you face the dragon. And when you have a hand beside you to face the dragon, the fight's more worth fighting, the dragon looks smaller, and there's a point in fighting, it's not so dark. We all know this. Our veterans know this. Men don't fight wars by themselves. I had this flash the other night that the perfect way of ending wars would be to say to all the armies in the world, you don't go out in groups anymore. You don't go out with your buddies. We're going to change wars. What you're going to do is go out all by yourself with your gun. <laughs> There's another guy coming towards you over the hill, and you fight him, OK? I think wars would stop instantly because that's not how we fight wars. We fight wars with our buddies, right? We need other people to deal with the hugeness of life. We need other people to help us regulate our own emotions. The thing about love is it um, turns us on, it makes us emotional, it also soothes us. And now I have to go back to my slides because I'm gonna give you the whole thing off the top of my head and get confused if I don't stay with my slides. So what am I saying here? I'm telling you that we know so much about love and that basically we can define it. Love is not a frenzy of sex and sentiment. Love is an ancient, wired-in survival code that is designed to keep key loved ones close to us. And if you read neuroscience, it is amazing when you look at it just how much of our brain is dedicated to picking up cues from other people and connecting with other people. For example, your brain is designed so that you read the cues coming from somebody else's face in 100, of a, 100 milliseconds. And in 300 more milliseconds, your face has imitated the expression you see on the other person's face and the mirror neurons in your brain have given you and your body the feeling that you see on the other person's face. This is an amazing, amazing, amazing process where we read other people's intentions, where we communicate instantly, where we can move together, cooperate, coordinate, stand together. Right? This is um, I mean, when you just think about the intricacy, the exquisiteness of that, it's, it's almost as good as tango. <laughs> so we are homo vinculum. We think of ourselves as homo sapiens. We say we're the dominant uh, species on this planet because of our large cortex here. But basically, 
from my point of view and my reading of the bonding literature, we are homo vinculum. What I want to suggest to you is we have known this. In, you know this already in your feelings and in your emotions. You know this in your body, what I'm saying here. But in science, we have really only applied this to the mother-child bond. We haven't even included fathers in it, I don't think. If you think about it and you take the long, the long view, in the last 40 years, we have had a revolution in parenting. For example, you no longer take your child and drop your child off at the hospital and leave your child to have an operation, then pick your child up four days later. Why not? That's what they used to do in the 1950s, 60s, and um, some, in some places up into the 70s. Because it traumatizes the child all to hell. That's why, to the point where the child cannot regulate their own body. Right? That's why. So we've had this huge revolution in, in parenting that comes from our understanding of the bonds between mother and child. And you can think of the revolution I'm talking about as simply that suddenly in about the late 1980s, a group of folks, of whom I am very proud to say I was one, a group of folks started looking at all the child, mother and child bonding literature and saying, well, you know, it's really interesting because actually it doesn't look that different in adult bonding relationships and romantic love. Let's have a look at that. And if you think about it, there's huge similarities. We get all caught up in the differences because we get caught up in, well, romantic love is sexual, romantic love is mutual. As an adult, I don't need to hold onto somebody's hand all the time. I carry the sense of them within me. I can use my thoughts. I always use the example of, I, I got um, airplane phobic a few years ago. It was very bad because I fly all the time. <laughs> So, um, and what I found worked best was that when the plane's going down the tarmac, I listen to my husband's voice in my head. So you can't do that when you're three. You need the person close to you, right? But apart from the differences I've talked about, if you think about the bond between mother and child and the bond you have with your adult lover, they are amazingly similar. So, and I'm going to talk about how similar they are. So we are the one who bonds. And the fact that we bond is a strength. Somehow in our culture, we seem somehow to have decided that human beings at age 12 are suddenly supposed to be something called independent. I don't know how we ever came up with that, but from my point of view, it's, a, it's simply an error. It's simply an error. Okay? So, we always keep, and there's evidence now that if you look at adolescents, adolescents, in a sense, they move away from their parents, but it would be more accurate to say they hold on to their parents while also becoming more autonomous, right? And that that bond never stops being precious to them. And in some ways, what they do with that bond is they internalize it. So. This is a picture, and if you guys have seen me talk before, I think some people said they're coming to see me for a second time. So um, this is a picture that the surgeon in the OR said changed his life. Um, the surgeon basically said that he operated on fetuses in utero. And then one day, this little hand reached out of his mother's womb and grabbed onto his finger and wouldn't let go. <laughs> and suddenly he got, oh, oh wait, wait a minute, this is, um, this is not only a little person in here, this is a little person with a very clear direction. This is a little person who is grabbing onto my hand and holding onto it. One of the most revolutionary things that the father of attachment and bonding theory said in about the 1970s, one of them, John Bowlby, an English psychiatrist, one of the most revolutionary things he said that some people still have huge problems with is that the first instinct in man is not sex and aggression. The that which Freud said, that's it. That's the most powerful move. The first instinct in man is this. The first instinct in man is to reach, to reach 
for another human being to reach for that contact and hold onto it. That's the first instinct in man. So let me show you another little picture here. Intimates, from this point of view, are our ultimate resource. Intimates, the people we love, create safe haven for us to go to, protection and support, and a secure base for us to go out from. If I know you have my back and I can go home to you, I can go out into an uncertain world and I can explore, I can take risks, I can be confident because I can always phone home. <laughs> right? And we know that in our relationships. We say things like, after the interview, sweetie, call me and tell me how it went, okay? Right? I say, yes, I will. Yes, I'll call you and tell you. And you have this feeling that this person is with you. Then when you go into the interview, you think, even if they hate me, even if they hate me, when I go home, this person's going to look, look at me and care for me and help me deal with whatever happened. It's much more difficult for us to do that when we're alone. So we have safe haven and secure base. And what we know, I want to give you a feel for how this translates into research and back into our lives. I'm trying to do that a lot. Um, let me give you a feel for how that works. When you have this sense of connection with another person, it makes you amazingly more resilient. Um, Chris Fraley looked at people after 9-11, who, people who lived in the vicinity of the towers. And he went after the trauma, and he went 18 months later. And he found that the people who said, I have someone I really trust, someone I feel close to, who will help me and, and be there for me emotionally, I have this person that I trust. Those people, 18 months later, were doing OK. They'd come to terms with what happened to them. In some cases, they actually said, I've learned something. I actually feel like I'm a stronger human being from what's happened. The people who said, well, I try to talk to people, but they don't really listen. And I'm never sure that people really want to hear me. And, and sometimes I think they like me, but most of the time I think people don't care about me and they don't want to hear me. So I talk to them about it all the time because I really want them to hear me. Or the people who said, I'm fine. I don't really need to talk to anybody, you know. I'm fine. I just think it's better. You know, you don't need to talk about those things. There's really no point. I'm just fine. And other people don't want to hear that, OK? And there's really no point in me talking about that. Those people, those two people, the anxious and what we call the avoidant people, were having a real hard time. They were having nightmares, post-traumatic stress disorder, all kinds of symptoms. Secure bonding with other people gives us a sense of resilience. And later in the talk, I'm going to talk to you about our research study that actually showed that secure bonding can actually change the way your brain perceives threat not just deals with threat, but perceives threat. Another instance I could give you in terms of secure base, um, Feeney did a beautiful study with young career women, young career women who value being able to go out into the world and take on the world. What he found was that young career women who say they're close to their partner and they can confide in their partner and get support, are more confident when they go out into the world. They take more risks. They explore more, because they can call home. They explore more, and they reach their career goals faster. The other one I want to give you is a beautiful image that my colleague Mario Michelanza in Israel has in one of his research studies. He looked at Israeli prisoners of war who had been, some of them had been in solitary confinement for up to four years in small cells where they couldn't even stand. And he looked at the Israeli prisoners of war that were able to come out back into society and basically regulate their emotions and heal from that, and the ones that were not able to and were really had enormous problems with PTSD. And what he found was that the ones that were able to deal with it and go back into society had actively used their loved ones and the people they were bonded with as a safe haven in the prison. I'll give you an example. The man said, it was dark in my cell, and I couldn't stand. And I would listen to sounds, and I knew that 
I decided that some of those sounds meant it was morning. And every morning, I'd change my position, and I'd sit in a certain place in my cell, and I'd think about my wife. And I'd close my eyes until I could actually see her, until it was like she was in the cell with me. And I'd imagine that she was right there, and I'd talk to her about what was happening to me and how hard it was in the cell. And then I'd deliberately go over the day we met, the day I proposed to her, the good times we had, what it felt like for her to hold me, what it felt like when we made love, until I could almost feel her skin. And finally, I'd hang on to all this for as long as possible, and then at the end, when I couldn't hang on to it anymore, I'd tell her, I'm not going to die here. I'm going to come home to you, and I know you're going to be waiting for me. Did you get the feel for that? Right? If you think about being in a small, dark cell, the number, of, the number of survival strategies we have are not really huge, right? I don't know, we could tell ourselves jokes, or I'm being facetious, OK. But you know, um, they, are, they are very big. So this is one of the examples of people actually going into and using their attachment figure. By the way, for some folks who have very deep religious beliefs, God can be an attachment figure. If you talk to the military chaplains in the US Army, they will tell you what they don't show on the movies, which they will tell you that under fire, like in a foxhole in Iraq, everybody's screaming. And what they will tell you is, um, particularly if it gets very close and somebody gets wounded, that people are screaming, and he says they're always screaming the same thing. I said, what is it? He said, they're screaming for God, their mother, or the person they love, their partner. They're screaming the partner's name. They're screaming for their mother or screaming for God. And I said, well, what happens if you, if you don't believe in God? He said, well, Sue, in a foxhole in Iraq, there isn't anyone who doesn't believe in God, first of all. <laughs> We're all screaming. Right? And also, you know, people will, will search back, and they will find another human being that they found connected with, and they'll scream. Right? So, it's fascinating. It's kind of like this is our basic wired in way of dealing with our fragility as human beings. And basically being able to stand up in the world and walk out into all that uncertainty and deal with the threat. So love is an emotion. We know that. And I think it's interesting that um, I just saw on the internet the other day, um, ABC in the States did a survey as to the most soothing music that had ever been put out in the last few years. I thought it was really interesting. It was Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. That's a song about attachment and bonding. That fits very well with the science of love. So I'm going to say that we need to recognize that love is an emotion. And one of the things that's happening is we're starting to understand emotions better. And we're starting to understand that emotions are not random and strange and mysterious either. That we can really understand them. And I could talk to you a whole evening about that. But let's just recognize for a minute that we have powerful, positive emotions in love. These emotions move us. They give us meaning. They give us aliveness. And also, they, you know, for example, they turn on bonding hormones like oxytocin that turn off fear, that turn on dopamine, which is the, the reward hormone in our brain. We have all these amazing positive emotions. We also have painful emotions, emotions like loss, right? emotions that we know the price of love. So I'm going to show you three pictures just to give you a feel for how this emotion works. Three pictures that show how powerful emotion is, especially bonding. Emo emotions, we experience our strongest emotion in our intimate bonds. Robert Peraz for pauses at his son's name on 9-11 memorial during the 10th anniversary ceremonies at the site of the World Trade Center. Phyllis Siegel, 76, left, and Connie Koploff, 
84, both of New York, embraced after becoming the first same-sex couple to get married at the Manhattan City Clerk's Office in 2011. Terry Garola is reunited with her daughter after serving in Iraq for seven months. If you look at that lady's face, the complicated emotions, what I'm pointing out here is you are all moved by these emotions. Unless you're totally numbed out, or maybe in Ottawa, completely frozen. <laughs> that is a possibility, OK. Uh, you are moved by these emotions. These emotions, this longing that we have for connection, this pain and sadness at loss, and the bittersweetness you can see in this woman's face, the, the mixture of relief and joy, and somehow there's still pain in there. She's been away from her daughter for seven months. Maybe she thought she was never coming back. This is not just random. This is wired in, these responses, by millions of years of evolution. And we know that there are basically six wired in emotions, and everyone on this planet can read those emotions. So we're really starting to understand the mechanism of this. We also associate um, love with pain. And I just want to say something about that for a minute. Sometimes we think about when people talk about hurt feelings. I know as a therapist, I used to think about that as a metaphor. Um, what I would like to point out to you is all the recent research says it's no metaphor. Especially where intimates are concerned, rejection or feeling deserted and moved away from, and I'm going to show you a very powerful video in a minute that shows you this, being rejected or have something turn away from you, all the evidence is from people like Nancy Eisenberger working in California who does brain scans of this kind of thing, all the evidence is that that hurts. Criticism, rejection, and distance when you depend on someone literally hurts. It's coded in the same way and in the same part of your brain as physical pain. It's almost like your body doesn't distinguish because physical pain and having no one to depend on is a danger cue for your mammalian brain. Your ecological niche that you are designed for and to th designed to thrive in is close connection with a few precious others. So not to find that available is pain. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, Hooley, I think she's now in Boston. I can never remember. Jill Hooley um, studies criticism from intimates. And she has one study that I have in Love Sense that I don't know how got through an ethics, an ethics board because she took women and subjected them to um, critical speeches by their mother. <laughs> I had an English barmaid for a mother, <laughs> and she was something else. And um, I don't think that should have got through ethics, because <laughs> okay. Anyway, she subjected them. This wasn't a partner, but it's an attachment figure. She subjected them to critical remarks by their mother. You know the kind of thing. Let me give you a feel. Uh, my mother used to come from England, and I used to be, I'd say, now things are going to be different between me and my mother now. We're going to be nice to each other, and we're not going to fight, and we're going to get along. And it would last until she picked her luggage off the, <laughs> the carousel. Because I would be saying things like, I'm so glad you came, Mom. And she'd say, yes, dear, it's lovely to see you. I thought, there you are. See, it's all going to be different. And then she'd say, what have you done to your hair? And that color really doesn't suit you. I really don't understand why you wear those shoes. And are you still in that stupid job? I don't know. And boom. <laughs> what Jill Hooley says is, if you look at people in brain scans, or you look at how their body responds, you look at their heart rate, basically the conclusion she comes to is, criticism from those we love is like low-grade punches to the brain. This is to the point now where Eisenberger is now doing a study where when people are sad and they have heartache from being rejected in relationships, she's giving them Tylenol. 
It's going to be kind of interesting. I don't know. I can't imagine having a fight with my husband and then saying, I'm going to take eight Tylenols. Now, so it doesn't work somehow. But you never know. Maybe I should try it. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> the other thing I want you to get, which is really new here, when we talk about these emotions, is Yak Panksep, who is in um, Philadelphia, who's been studying rats' brains for years, and who says things that we sometimes have problem with, like actually a rat's brain isn't that different from yours, believe it or not, in basic structure. What he basically says is that mammals, mammals who are born helpless and who depend on care and closeness to survive, have a special neural pathway in their fear system that is reserved just for monitoring how close the attachment figure is and how responsive that attachment figure is. I want you to notice how often I use the word responsive. People say, what's a good relationship? A good relationship is where you call and the other person responds on an emotional level. That's the best definition I can think of of a good relationship. So Yak Panksep says that in our mammalian brain, when we call and no one answers, when we call and we get criticism, or we simply get someone turning away, that lights up that neural pathway, and he calls it primal panic. And he says, that's coded into our brain when we're very, very young. So to give you a feel the difference this makes, I look at a couple fighting. What do I see? I look at a couple fighting, and somebody else might see lack of communication skills or that they're really acting out the way they were with their mother, or that they don't have any insight, or they're being unreasonable, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I look at that couple, I say, they're calling and calling, and they don't know how to ask for what they need, and they don't know how to respond. They're missing each other, and they're basically protesting this distance and separation. And when the fights get really hot, or when silence reigns, they're in primal panic, and they're trying to deal with it. The issue is our culture hasn't really had even a language for this. The language we have is that we're adults, and you're supposed to be grown up, and you're not supposed to get upset, you know, and you're supposed to deal with everything. And somehow, we're used to moving out of the emotional channel and not even talking this kind of language, not even thinking in these terms. So I hope you're getting that this is a huge shift we're talking about here. The other thing about thinking about mother and child and adult lovers is they use the same three strategies in their relationship. The same three strategies. What are these strategies? Reaching. This is the best strategy. Best strategy, if you feel safe enough, is to think, what's happening to me? I feel really upset because we were going to go out tonight and have a special evening, and now my partner's told me that he's too busy, he's going to work on the computer. And actually, he didn't even look at me when he walked in the house. He went straight up to his office. Why am I feeling so upset? Oh, well, I'm feeling kind of hurt. I feel angry, but actually, I feel hurt. I feel kind of lonely and kind of sad, and like it didn't really matter to him that we were going to go out on this date. From the point of view of attachment theory and research, the best thing you can do is get hold of that, listen to it, and walk into your partner's office and say, hey, you know what? Can I talk to you? Because I'm feeling really disappointed that we're not having our date, and I don't know if you, it matters to you, and I'm feeling kind of left and sad and kind of hurt about it. And what you're doing there is you're coming out and you're reaching and you're asking for a response. The point is we don't like to do that because if I say that to you, you can see me. And what we all think is there's a large target on the front of my chest. <laughs> and if you really want to hurt me, you can go, right? Yeah, that's true. It's a risk. So in good relationships, we have enough safety to risk that. We go and we do that. Most of us can't do that all the time. Maybe there's someone in this audience who says, yes, I can do that all the time in my relationships. But most of us can't do that all the time. But we're talking about risking and reaching for your partner 
in an emotional way and inviting them to come close. That's the most functional thing, and we're going to watch a baby doing that on a, a piece of tape in a moment. When you can't do that, there aren't that many other alternatives. What you do when you can't do that is you push. You say, so aren't we going out tonight then? I thought we were going out tonight, but apparently we're not going out tonight. Is that right? That we're not going out tonight. Is that, is that it? Is that it? Yep, yep. I want you to listen to the change there. I'm pushing for a response. What I'm really saying is, respond to me, respond to me, help me with my emotions. But the way it comes across is anger and contempt and a demand. Well, if we're not going out tonight, I'd like, to t I'd like you to tell me when we are going to that restaurant. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we get a response. The person says, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you're right. I, 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 I don't know why I didn't think about it. I, uh, sometimes. So, so that sometimes we get rewarded, right? But lots of times, unfortunately, when we push and demand, we push the other person away. And the other person says, well, um, I have this work to do, you know. I mean, what about the work I have to do? I mean, what are you getting all angry for? Can't you deal with the fact that, you know, I'm the breadwinner in this family, and da, 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 da. Everybody gets, yeah, World War II starts. Yeah, OK. So push and demand. And when it gets chronic, all, it's almost like all you do is push and demand. And the other way to do it is to turn away and say, I guess we are going out for our date, but that's fine. I don't really care. I'm going, I'm going to play um, Bridge with the Boys, OK? I don't know when I'll be back. See you. Turn away. This is about it. I want you to think about that. We think about love as this incredibly complicated, intricate, mysterious thing, right? But really, when you look at interacting lovers, they're mostly doing one of these three things. That's all they do. And one of them is much more. We do all of them some of the time. Right. The tricky part comes when we never can reach, we never feel safe enough to reach and invite the person close. All we're doing is pushing, or all we're doing is shutting down and moving away. And then, unfortunately, when I push, you go the other way. And when I shut down, I shut you out. And that creates primal panic in you. I'm telling you, in about five minutes, a struggle that some people deal with their whole lives, and nobody ever helps them see and nobody ever helps them understand so they can actually step out of it. Yeah? Because if we don't understand the dance we're it caught in, we just keep doing it. We just keep doing the dance. So let me play this tape for you. This is on YouTube. You can see it. It's a brilliant man called Ed Tronic, and he studies bonding between mothers and infants. <clears throat> Babies this young are extremely it up a bit, responsive please. to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think, I think that we infants can hear it. could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my good girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly uh -huh. picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She reaches. She points because she's used to the mother. Where looking. are you? She points. Yeah. Are you there? The baby puts both hands up in front of her and Respond to says, me. what's happening here? She makes that breachy sound at the mother, like 
come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Look at what she says, I'm here. Oh, yes. Oh, what a big girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Right. What I would like you to get is that when the baby goes, the baby reaches, and that's what we do in love when we feel safe enough and we can take a risk. Then the baby protests and pushes for contact. She goes, ah! In adult relationships, we don't do that. We should try it, actually. <laughs> it's more obvious, right? If you can imagine if we all stood in the kitchen and went, ah! <laughs> we say things like, you didn't. Why didn't you? By the way, and have you? That's what we do. And, you know, and, you know, it, it, so we do that. And if you notice, the other thing the baby does is this. I'll shut you out. I'll shut down. Because then I've got itch. I'll shut down my emotion, right? And also, I shut you out because you've actually become a danger cue for me. So I'll shut you out. Now, the mother is sitting there, and they're doing an experiment. So the mother's still there when the baby turns around. It's very tricky, though, because in adult relationships, that doesn't always work. What I want you to understand is all that mother did was nothing. All she did was not respond. She wasn't abusive. She didn't do any, all kinds of nasty things. She didn't take away the baby's toys. The baby goes into a meltdown. This is about how much we need this emotional connection and how cued into it we are. So if you say to me, so what do you think the message is here for lo adult love relationships? The message here for adult love relationships is that the most important thing is to be present with somebody emotionally, tune into them, and when you get this gap happening and disconnection, you repair it. The mother says, it's okay, I'm here. Right? I think we all need to know how to do that in adult relationships. We all need to, the difference between successful couples and not successful couples isn't that they fight, all couples fight. It isn't that they get stuck sometimes in distance. The difference in the end is successful couples know how to tune into the relationship, realize there's something wrong, and take the risk to turn and reach for the other person and repair so that you can get this repair where the mother says, I'm here, and the baby responds. The other thing I think it's important, I'm going to talk to all the men in the audience. Men have been taught that what they need to do in relationships is perform. They need to do tasks. They need to be good protectors, good providers. They need to do all these things, and they need to take care. In my institute just down the road, right, we see, over the years, we've seen hundreds of men who come in trying to be very good spouses, doing all kinds of tasks, and giving their wife advice, and doing tasks. When, in fact, from our point of view, it's very clear that you don't have to be perfect or perform in this kind of way all the time in a relationship. If you want a relationship, what you have to be is emotionally present, just like that mother is with the baby. So sometimes we say to a man who's putting all kinds of pressure on himself, you know what, you don't have to know what to do all the time. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to work so hard. You just have to be there for your wife. And usually guys go, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I say, I say, well, I don't know what to do. See, she's upset right now, right now, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with that. And I say, so why don't you turn and tell her 
What do you see? So I see she's upset. I said, how do you feel about it? I feel awful. I don't, I don't like it when she's upset. I feel bad. I feel sad. But I don't understand. I said, good. So can you tell her, sweetie, I care about your feelings. I feel awful when you're sad. I feel so upset when you're sad. But I don't really know what to do. I just don't want you to hurt. He looks at me like I'm crazy. Like, that's not going to work. And he turns and he does it. And even in this slightly artificial situation where his wife is watching me coach him, she goes, ah! <laughs> and he looks at me like, OK, what just happened? I don't know. <laughs> and we say, you're brilliant. The other thing we say to men is, you do know how to do this, you know. Men say, no, there's something. In the literature now, you say men are wired wrong or something. No, they're not. We teach them this. I, so we say, men say, well, I just can't do it. You say, yes, you do know how to do it. How do you put your children to bed? Men say, well, what do you mean? I say, what do you do with your children? I say, well, I said, tell me about your son. Oh, well, I take him out to bed, and I tell him stories. And I do you smile at him. Yeah, I smile at him. And do you touch him? Yeah, I stroke his back. And what do you do? He said, well, we have this little game called Purple Butterfly. I tell him, you know, in the morning, the Purple Butterfly will come and, and take you to school. And, we, and I hold him, and I sing to him, and I tell him, your daddy's special little one. I say, oh, you're brilliant at being emotionally present. You know all about it. It's just harder to do with your lady because she looks dangerous. Your son's safe. <laughs> <laughs> from our point of view and from the point of view of bonding, conflict in romantic relationships is 90% protest and emotional disconnection. So from our point of view, you can help people negotiate about the chores until you're purple. It's really not, it might help, it might save one fight in their relationship, but it's not really going to change anything. If you're going to change things, you have to help people make sense of their love relationship, make sense of the dance they're involved in, and know what's triggering this primal panic. People need to know that they're a source of amazing support for their partner, but they're also a source of danger that you really literally hurt your spouse when you criticize, reject, or turn away. Somehow, we don't think of distance in those terms. In fact, with children, we, all, we say things like, time out. And I actually know people who teach couples time out. And sometimes people have said to me, why don't you teach your couples to take time out? And I say, it's a very dangerous strategy because how do you feel when somebody turns and walks away from you in a fight? Does that calm you down? Does it feel good? <laughs> then what happens next? I wait for them to come back, <laughs> and I get my weapons ready, and then when they come back... <laughs> so we have to understand these cues or we get them wrong. So what are the laws of love that I've told you about tonight? Our deepest survival instinct to emotionally connect with special ones. Others are our primary baseline resource. My colleague Jim Cohn, who's a neuroscientist, says, there's all this stuff out in the world about how you're supposed to take care of yourself, you're supposed to go to the gym, you're supposed to meditate, you're supposed to just tell yourself in the mirror every morning, you're worth it. Do you see how many commercials that's in these days? Everything from talcum powder to what you wash your clothes with, they always end with, you're worth it, right? So we're all supposed to be able to do this. Jim Cohn says, no, we've got mammalian brain, and our basic baseline strategy is not to deal with our emotions all by ourselves. It's amazing hard work to do that. It takes too much glucose to your brain. We're wired to use somebody else's brain as a helper. <laughs> we're wired to turn to somebody else and say, I'm, ha I'm having a hard time. Are you having a hard time with that? I don't, did you, what, how did you feel about that scene in that movie? That really upset me. The person says, yes, it really upset me. And suddenly we feel better. Oh, right, OK. I'm not crazy, and I'm not alone. And you had a hard time, too. And the very fact we're talking about it somehow makes it easier. That's what we're wired for. So reaching is our best and primary strategy. It's functional. It is not a weakness to need other people. 
People come into our sessions and they say, well, I can't ask my wife for comfort, or I can't ask my husband for this because they'll despise me. They think they'll, they'll think I'm weak and pathetic. We have taught people that. It is not a weakness. It is a strength to be able to reach for other people. True love is open, responsive. Are you there for me? It's being able to be emotionally engaged, attuned, and listen to each other's signals, invite each other's uh, close, so that you're dancing a synchronized dance with each other. Nobody can do that all the time, by the way. We talk about falling in love and imply that then you fall in, and if it works, that's it. It's a steady state, and all of us know that's not true. In a long-term relationship, you lose each other, you fight, the person becomes the enemy for a moment, but in a good long-term relationship, you find your way back to each other, and you fall in love again and again and again. You can recover. Separation and isolation traumatizes, emotional separation, and we know the three main moves in the dance. So just those, I could go on, there's a lot of other ones we could talk about, Chemicals like oxytocin, we could talk about mirror neurons. Um, just those are a lot. I'm going to suggest that that's a revolution. That what I've just told you in the last how many minutes is a revolution. Whether, well, however you think about revolution, you can think about it in lots of ways. This is a quiet revolution that's happened in libraries, in labs, at conferences, written down on little pieces of paper. And what I'm really trying to do in this book, Love Sense, is to take it out of all those places and put it into our culture to give us an alternative to this massive tsunami of pessimism and all this stuff about how um, relationships aren't worth it anyway and marriage is finished and monogamy is finished. And um, if you listen sometimes to the people who come into our sessions and they talk about young married women meeting in, in book groups and deciding that really you can't have a relationship that lasts more than five years anyway. After that, you're not even friends anymore. This is disturbing, particularly since these relationships are the basis of our families. So let's talk about sex for a minute, and then we're going to talk about study, and then I'm going to take questions from you. I just want to go into sex very briefly because we could be in it all night, okay? From the point of view of this research, sex is a bonding behavior. Yes, you can separate it out. You can separate almost any human behavior out and take it out of context. And when you do that, it looks weird. Do you get the hint there? Yes. I think we're doing really weird stuff with sex because we're taking it out of its normal context. But basically, in mammals, especially mammals who get together and rear their young together, so they have to be able to cooperate and they protect each other, and they prefer to mate with this one person and they groom each other and they, they move together to protect their young and to rear their young, especially in those animals, sex is a bonding behavior. For one thing, you're flooded with cuddle hormone oxytocin and orgasm, but we also know now you're flooded with oxytocin when you even think about your partner. There's all kinds of interesting research looking at bonding and sexuality, and I invite you to go and look at the book for that. If you think about it, how you work with your emotions and how you reach the strategies you use, whether you reach or demand or turn away and shut off, that's how you make love. So we could talk about this forever, but let me suggest to you that what we call solace sex is usually if you're pushing and demanding in your relationship and you don't believe the other person's going to respond. And the only way they're going to respond is if you make a lot of noise like the baby. You go, ah! Respond to me, respond to me. Where are you? I'll make you respond to me. Most of those folks, when you talk to them about sexuality, they'll tell you, when, I'm being, when we're making love, that's the time I feel secure. That's the time I feel secure. And my whole focus, actually, is on the comfort and the security. It's, I feel it's solace for me. I, and this is men and women. Men and women say, orgasm's fine, but really what I like is that I, I know she desires me. When, when we're making love, I feel secure, and I use making love as a barometer of the relationship. So if she tells me that she doesn't want to make love to me one night, 
whoa, I'm in primal panic. Okay, what do you mean? <coughs> right? It's a big deal. So we call this solace sex. People are making love. Yes, it's erotic, but that's not the focus. And they don't talk about that. They talk about the cuddling and the reassurance. Sealed off sex is people who say, these are the guys who turn away all the time, and they say, um, I don't believe in depending on other people. Um, I'm safer by myself. Other people will let you down. I don't want to trust other people. I think human beings should be independent. These folks say, um, actually, um, one night stands are fine. Um, I don't mind one night stands. And if you talk to them about sex, they're focused on performance and sensation. The tricky part about that one is that if you're focused just on performance and sensation and you're not tuned into your emotions, I'm going to suggest to you emotions are the music of the dance of bonding. If you take the emotions out of sex, it's like dancing without music. Now, I dance 10 hours a week. I couldn't dance half an hour without music. It's silly. I can't even coordinate with my partner. I can't do it. Okay. So it seems to me that a lot of sexuality we're subjected to and shown on movie screens and outside in our society is what we call sealed off sex. It's one dimensional. It's focused on sensation and performance. There's nothing about connection in there. If it's one dimensional, you have to up the sensation and the performance all the time for it not to be boring as hell. And these are the folks, I suggest to you, who would tell us that being in a long-term relationship means inevitably that you will die of sexual boredom. Next time somebody says that to you, I want you to remember this talk and say, could you show me the research on that, please? Laumann, who does the best research in North America at the University of Chicago, says, the people who have the best sex, enjoy it the most, and have sex most often are people who are happy long-term relationships. Okay. For one thing, if you can just imagine, take one part of it, in the movie, sex happens without any communication at all. Nobody even has to say something like, excuse me, could you move over? I'm falling off the bed. It never happens, okay? There's no need for communication. It all just evolves all by itself. This is nonsense. If you think about sexuality as an enormous act of coordination, you have to communicate. <laughs> so what I say in the book is, actually, the best recipe for great sex is safe connection, not constant novelty. And what you see out there in, in the literature is, in, in the media, is constant novelty. So let me start to wind down by telling you about a study we did that will illustrate some of these laws for you. Um, and this happened here in your city. Okay, sometimes we think that Ottawa is a small little capital, and we don't think about revolutions happening here. So this part of the revolution happened here. Okay, basically, what we did was we did a study looking at whether we could change people's bonds, not just their satisfaction in the relationship, but their bonds. So we took the women in these relationships. They were unhappy, unhappy in their marriages, and they were felt insecure with their partner. We took the women, and before they came to do therapy, we put them in an fMRI machine. And we told them, when you see an X in front of your face, you're going to be shocked on your ankles 30% of the time. So we leave them alone in the machine. They see the X. Their brain lights up like the 4th of July. Right? Oh, I'm not in the States. Um, like Canada Day. Their brain lights up like the sky in Canada Day. And if you ask them if the shock hurts, they say, yes, it really hurts. You have a stranger hold their hand. They see the X. Their brain lights up like Canada Day. And they say the shock hurts. Their husband holds their hand. Their brain lights up like Canada Day, and the sh I've lost the sound, thank you. Um, the husband is not a safety cue. He's not a safe haven. He's not a secure base. He doesn't help. We give them 20 sessions of EFT, Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy, where they have what we call hold me tight conversations, where people talk about their fears, talk about their needs, and we help people respond and create this safe emotional connection. What happens? What happens is the women lie alone in the machine. 
they see the X, their brain lights up, they say the shock hurts. The stranger holds their hand, their brain lights up a little tiny bit less, but the shock still hurts. They see the X, their husband holds their hand. Nothing happens. And if you ask them if the shock hurt, they say, it's uncomfortable. That's interesting. That's where the science of love is going. What happened there? What happened there from our point of view is their brain, I'll show it to you. Pre-therapy partner hand-holding, post-therapy partner hand-holding. If you ask me what the blue means, my colleague Jim Cohn says it means that they're not dead. <laughs> In other words, this is very minimal stuff, but they're not dead, they're still alive. Okay? So, this is fascinating. So what we've talked about is it's not that the husband holding their hand, now they have safe connection, helps them control their fear. Because then their prefrontal cortex would be lit up all to hell because that's where all the control centers are. It's, they, it seems as if the brain is so quiet that the contact with the husband is actually changing the way the women perceive the threat as it's being encoded in their brain. Having a love relationship really does make you live in a safer world. You don't just deal with threat better, things are less threatening. And I'm thinking about me in the plane, listening to my husband's voice in my head, when the plane would take off. I would listen to my husband's voice, that's very soothing to me, it has this effect on me, it has this effect on my body, then I'd be up in the air. It's the same kind of thing. But it's very, very fascinating stuff, and this is where um, we're going. And this sort of stuff started off in the, the research with children, okay, where you looked at the mother changing. So I'm not going to show you this couple because I'm running out of time. So love is no strange, random rush of sentiment. It makes sense. And what we know we can shape, and we really can make it, and we really can make it last. So what I would like from this, this um, study of love is that we start, we start our lives like this. That baby's brain was formed expecting those hands to be there. We are homo vinculum, the one who bonds. We start life like this, and what I would like to happen as a result of understanding love is that more and more of us get the chance to end up our lives like this. Thank you, and let's take questions.